My recommendation is based on longevity to slow down aging, reduce the risk of disease, and to increase lifespan. And the diet that time and time again is shown in countless studies to be the best for this is the Mediterranean style diet. Now, the Mediterranean style diet has variation to it. I mean, you can look at different regions of the world, like um, the diet in Okinawa, Japan is not technically the Mediterranean diet, but it has a lot of similarities with the Mediterranean diet. So I'm encompassing all of those when I say this. And the foundation of these diets is that they are largely plant-based. They have a lot of uh, legumes and beans, mushrooms, um, a healthy amount of of, uh, fruits in there as well. They have a lot of seafood. They have a moderate to low amount of red meats, and they have a moderate amount of poultry. They have low, very low levels of, or, or if at any, if at all, uh, any sort of processed foods. Um, they are high in healthy fats like olive oil, for example. Um, avocado is also a, a healthy fat. They're getting omega threes through that seafood that they're consuming, uh, and so it's all foods fresh from the earth. They're getting a lot of those phytonutrients. Um, these are plant based nutrients that are not even that well studied oftentimes. A lot of these are just like, um, it's not like the commonly well-studied vitamins and minerals like vitamin A and the Bs and C, D, E, K, and so on. These are some things that people are not necessarily even aware of, like quercetin Mm -hmm. and fisetin and EGCG and all of these things, right? So you're getting dosages of those from uh, eating all of these plant-based foods and overall, that that is arguably the the healthiest. Now, I mentioned earlier, it's also about quantity of food and the timing. Now, the nice thing about this diet is that, first of all, it is something that people have a much easier time adhering to than other diets. You've got extreme diets out there, like a ketogenic diet is quite extreme. Uh, I would argue a carnivore diet is quite extreme for most people, where you can only have meat and you can't have anything else. Uh, so all of these, like, these these diets that are at the extremes, people tend to have a harder time maintaining over the long term. And you're also running risks of nutrient deficiencies or getting too much of a given um, macronutrient. For example, too much saturated fat is common in ketogenic diets. Not saying it's always the case, but it tends to be common in those diets. Cholesterol levels tend to go up significantly. Now that's, people argue that cholesterol might not be as as big of an issue as, as um, once thought, but until it's proven not to be, I would consider it something that you want to keep lower on the lower ends, especially ApoB and LDL cholesterol. So anyway, it's something that you can comply with. And, um, and then you also don't feel like overindulging with it, right? So when you're eating these whole foods, like imagine having like a, a, a plate of fish and broccoli and spinach and olive oil um, and then maybe some like dark chocolate with some berries and stuff after that meal, you're not like starving for other foods, right? When you compare that to the calorically dense nutrient poor foods that are processed foods, people overeat them because they're not getting the nutrients they need and they're hyper palatable. So people just have these cravings for it. So in terms of the amount, it's the best. And then in terms of the timing, your audience may have heard of the idea of uh, time-restricted feeding. Some people call it intermittent fasting. It's not exactly the precise term for it. Right. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. So technically, intermittent fasting is when you are are not only timing the meals, but then you're also eating fewer calories than you otherwise would be. If you're eating the same amount, you're just cramming it into a smaller eating window, which is what most people do. That's technically time-restricted feeding. So you're saying it's it's not about the calories, it's, it's just about restricting it to a time frame. There's uh, scientific arguments on both sides. So some would say that the, that the benefits of the intermittent fast in and of itself is due to uh, the fewer calories that people tend to consume when they are um, eating in a smaller window. But then there's also the question of, for example, um, the circadian rhythm and uh, the effects that the circadian rhythm have on our metabolisms. And so, for example, if you're eating carbs early in the morning, your body is going to process them better and you're going to require less insulin and the blood glucose won't get as high 
as if you're eating those same carbs at night. So there is something to the timing in whatever eating window you choose. So the most ideal, and I don't personally uh, do this uh, for the matter of convenience for me, but the most ideal would be to start your eating earlier in the day and to end it earlier in the evening and maybe have that as like an eight hour eating window. So, you know, maybe that's like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or something, right? Um, And to have more of your carbs earlier in the day especially because you're going to be physically active earlier in the day. And then at, at night and in the evening, you're not moving much and the blood glucose will go higher as a result. What I do personally is I find myself eating more like 11 to 7, partly because I find myself super focused early in the morning and I just have like a, a black coffee. And um, and when I eat a lot early in the morning, I'm just not as productive with my work. So I, I delay it a little bit. So do you just do that in two meals or do you like, does the number of meals matter or, or not? I think that for, there's, there's no definitive answer to that. And I think that although you'll, you'll have some people online saying you want the fewest meals possible, I don't think that that there's any evidence that that's actually uh, true in terms of, you know, health spans and lifespans. Um, I think that as long as you, if you're going, you know, 16 hours without food, you have a long period where your blood glucose is lower, you're not secreting hormones like insulin, your body is engaging in autophagy to to get calorie needs and so on to keep you fueled and awake and and so on. So um, I think that it's probably perfectly fine to have uh, multiple meals in there. I don't see evidence that there wouldn't be, um, that it wouldn't be good. I personally, um, I'll break my fast with a smoothie that I'll have because I'll I'll work out in the morning. So it'll be high in protein, but I I typically use a plant-based protein, which is lower in an amino acid called methionine, which is associated in many different animal species with accelerating aging. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the reason I go with a plant-based protein. I add to that, you know, mushroom powder and uh, some creatine and um, celery, um, carrot, Um, some frozen kale or spinach, a handful of things. I blend that up. I start, I break my fast with that. Then a couple of hours later, I'll have a meal. I'll have a lunch. I'll typically probably about two hours or so after that have um, a small snack. Like it might be, um, you know, something that has a modest amount of protein so I can hit the amount of protein I need for the day to maintain my muscles. Um, And then I will have a dinner meal close to around seven o'clock. 